real life. A very warm welcome and very good morning from India. It's a bright sunny morning here, and we welcome you all for the AIS uh, International Ophthalmic Conclave 2024. The topic for this session is management of uveitis, our approach in 2024. I am Dr. Subhav, and I shall be host for this session. We welcome our chairperson for today, Dr. Jyotirmay Biswas, our moderator, Dr. Vishali Gupta. Over to you, sir, to welcome all the speakers. Good morning. It's indeed a great privilege for us to hold this uh, course, Management of EVHSR Approach in 2024. I am grateful to um, All India Ophthalmological Society for giving us the opportunity uh, to EVHS as a um, 100 minutes uh, presentation. And we have got uh, stalwarts in ophthalmology today. So we have got Dr. Carlos Pavicio from Moorfields Hospital, London, UK, who is an authority on uveitis and particularly steroid implants, steroid, corticosteroids. Mm. So he, he is with us and he would be talking on corticosteroids, age-old treatment in uveitis with newer advances. We have got Dr. John Kempen from Ethiopia, who has done a several research studies um, on various drugs, and he would be talking on immunosuppressive, where do we stand? And Dr. Mark Smith is yet to join, but he would be talking about intravitreal injection and implants in UVA. Dr. John Kempen was in USA, Harvard, and now he is located in Ethiopia. Mark Smith is, uh, I understand, is in Tübingen, Germany. Dr. Bishali, we have got actually IUSG is, uh, advanced UVITIS course, and Dr. Bishali is busy, but um, she will join at 12 o'clock. No, sir, I'm here already. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. So we'll start that uh, uh, one, Bishali, to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biswas. And as Dr. Biswas mentioned, this is the program about vision for the future. And uh, he's already introduced John Kempen and uh, Carlos. And I don't see Mark D. Smith as yet. So hopefully he will join soon. With this, I would like to invite Dr. Biswas to give the first presentation and then we go on. No, Dr. Uh, Carlos will give the first presentation. Steroids okay. and... Steroid, corticosteroid, gradual okay. treatment in UVHS. Dr. Carlos, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bezos, Professor Gupta, for the kind invitation. Uh, I will be uh, sharing my slides with you. Give me a second here. Vishal, you will take the questions at the end of each presentation? Yes, sir. That would be better. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my presentation will focus on the use of um, of steroids, and I'm going to talk about oral steroids because Mark Smith will be covering the local therapy, and and uh, I think the importance here is, is as it says here, an age old treatment. So we've we've been um, using this medication for a very long period of time. As you can see here in the, in the history, just a little bit of that, just to see that we have reintroduced to steroids in the 50s, and then we figure out that the, the local application of steroids uh, for the anterior segment disease was preferred to systemic, and, and that would be then better used for posterior disease. That's already in 1956. Um, the good thing about steroids is that they work very rapidly. So the absorption takes a peak in 30 minutes to two hours, so it's a very effective rapid treatment to be used in, in our patients. And I'll discuss a bit more the different routes of, uh, of use and, and their, the fact that some of them will be faster. The intraocular penetration can be limited by the barriers, but when the eye is inflamed, that changes and the penetration then becomes more effective. Just a quick reminder of how steroids work. They get to the cytoplasm, form this complex with a receptor, and then it will be at the nuclear level that we will interfere with the synthesis of uh, uh, RNA, 
which would then result in the anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive efficacy activity, but also will be related to the side effects that we'll be discussing also in a minute. So these are some of the key actions of steroids and how they, they benefit our treatment. So they will interfere with the way the cells can migrate from the vessels to the tissues. They will keep lymphocytes more in the extravascular tissues rather than intravascular. They will prevent migration of macrophage, block prostaglandins. So there are multiple mechanisms by which they will uh, help us with the control of inflammation, including the, the inhibition of transcription of cytokines, which are essential for that mechanism. So normally when we're treating our patients, our cascade of treatment, you can see the very top of that cascade will be the use of oral steroids, uh, then followed by the introduction of other agents, which will, will not be the focus of my presentation. Just to put in here for you to uh, remember how our treatments usually progress. And finally, you know, we don't use alkylating agents very much anymore, but this would be our last line of therapy when required. So the oral dose, not, normally we try to go for one milligram per kilogram with the uh, re remembering that uh, we, we have uh, to be you know, worried about the high levels of steroids because of the, the risk of complications increasing. So more than 60 milligrams a day does increase the risk of uh, ischemic necrosis of the bone. If you need a more immediate control of the inflammation, which happens in some of our patients, so you have a VKH presenting with very bad presentation, kissing detachments, or very aggressive disease, then the use of intravenous pulses can be used, and this will have a much faster effect. And then, of course, the intention here is to taper the steroids as much as you can. Uh, sorry, just move a bit too fast. Uh, and, and try to the level to get to levels of less than 10 milligrams a day, which would be more compatible with long-term use. So this is just a suggestion of how the tapering should happen. So depending on how much you have, if you're using over 30 milligrams, you can taper by 10 milligrams. Uh, this is a weekly reduction uh, if in the standard dose. You can go faster if necessary. Between 13 and 15 and 30, you go by 5 milligrams, and then below 15, you go by 2.5 milligrams. And eventually, in very low levels, you may have to go down by 1 milligram at a time. And this can be weekly, sometimes even monthly reductions will be necessary. Other routes of administration, Professor Murray from Birmingham was a very strong advocate of the use of intramuscular methylprednisolone. So he felt that this is a good way sometimes of treating the patients rather than using prolonged oral steroids. But also, as I just mentioned to you now, the use of intravenous pulse methylpred is very useful in the control of more acute diseases. So in my view, steroids should be considered as fire extinguishers. They are there to suppress inflammation as quickly as we can when it's very acute and very potentially damaging to the eye. And then that will be followed by ways of maintaining that dose low and incorporating other strategies, which John Kempen will be discussing a bit later on with you. So the real problem with steroids is that they're used too little for too long. So this is where we result in the very large number of side effects that can be associated with use of steroids, prolonged use of steroids. This is a paper from our good friend and our the president of the IOF uh, moment, Professor uh, Nugin, uh, and he published this many years ago. And essentially what he was uh, showing here in this assessment of how the American colleagues were uh, treating patients with steroids, he showed very well that they're maintaining the patients at levels of steroids which were too high for too long. So if you look at this table here, it shows you that the, the mean dose at initial diagnosis and look at the mean dose by the time they were seeing again. And, and there's a gap between these assessments which were 600 days, 500 days. So it means the patients were kept at levels of about 40, an average 44 milligrams of steroids, which is extremely high for long-term use. So indicating that the poor knowledge and of, of the fact that steroids can produce a lot of problems. So effectively, we start with steroids usually to suppress inflammation. I talked to you about the mechanism of action in the nucleus, and then we try to match the potency of the use to the severity of the disease. So very aggressive disease requires larger doses. And this is the mistake that many people make in terms of using small doses of steroids when you really need higher doses. Then you escalate the potency if you require and then, of course, you'll be introducing other agents, uh, which will be discussed later on. So in terms of looking at the systematic uh, literature review of the uh, side effects and potential problems with the long-term use of steroids, 
And then even though we, we have managed to reduce the use of um, long-term steroids used over several decades in, in response to these adverse events, they may, the solution hasn't been definitive. So what we need is to really make sure that we understand the need to be combining medications and to establish a very tight control of inflammation and then reduce steroids as much as we can, as quickly as we can. I'll just mention a few of the problems that we can't forget and we as ophthalmologists tend to forget. Osteoporosis is an important one. Uh, despite our efforts to eliminate this therapy, if some patients still require long-term exposure, it has increased the risk of fractures in, in the bone, especially vertebra and, and the uh, femur. Uh, and we, we can suggest to the patients uh, lifestyle interventions, but in, the idea is to really try to bring the steroids down and use medications that will help the bone recover from the negative effect and sometimes modify treatments such as replacing proton pump inhibitors with a histamine 2 receptor blocker. Um, remember this very quickly that oral bisphosphonates are recommended in patients over the age of 40 who have a risk of fracture. Parathyroid hormone-based agents are recommended over bisphosphonates and donuzumab for patients with a very high risk of fracture. Um, one important thing also to say is that there is no recommendation to use an agent if the risk of fracture is low. So when the patient is assessed, if the risk is low, young patients, you don't have to start them on medications to uh, improve, protect the bone, but this is something to be considered in older patients and patients who present with a risk of fracture. Uh, bisphosphonates uh, have a very prolonged effect, different from donuzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, which is in fact affecting the osteoclast, which can be very effective, but doesn't last very long. And if not followed by one of the other drugs, it tends to uh, lead to rapid bone loss. So if you stop the, the taking the steroids, then there is a recommendation for this treatment also to be discontinued. This is just to show you here this uh, risk of fractures, but I want to stress some points uh, here to show that this loss of um, a bone can happen very quickly in the course of treatment, within the first three months or so. So we need to be mindful of that. Uh, and, and the two ways when it happens, either it's because the uh, is interfering uh, with the osteoblast and osteocyte uh, apoptosis, which then leads to the, uh, the, the loss of the density, but also it can be the microarchitecture architecture can be affected. And that would match the fact, the observations about that bisphosphonates when protecting the bone, the effect is more on the architecture rather than increasing bone mineral density. Just one reminder of the osteonecrosis, which is a potential risk of higher dose of steroids, is a vascular impairment and, and the bone marrow adipocyte uh, hypertrophy, which can result in osteonecrosis. So it's something to keep in mind if you're going to be using high doses, especially if you're planning to use that for a longer period of time. In terms of uh, adrenal insufficiency, another concern you have is if you're going to be taking more than five milligrams for a prolonged period of time, then you have to be mindful that you might be suppressing adrenal gland function. Uh, if patients are receiving regular rescue courses uh, over a, a six to 12 month period of time, uh, if they're taking inhaled steroids at high dose uh, and the total exposure combining different routes. So it's not only what you're giving, keep in mind the patient may be using steroids for other reasons, and that is a combination of all that can result in suppression of the adrenal gland. The one thing important to remember, if you have to reduce steroids very rapidly for whatever reasons, you can do so by not completely zeroing it, especially if you're over four weeks, but you can go down to 7.5 milligrams or equivalent or prednisone equivalent, and that will allow you then time to gradually reduce and protect the adrenal gland after that. Remember, psychosis is an important problem and can be induced by steroids, especially high doses. And, and can many times result in patients taking their own lives uh, and, and having or taking other people's lives because of the actions they, they take. So an important consideration when using steroids, getting a good history. So this would be the contraindications. I put psychosis there as one of the formal contraindications for the use of steroids if the patient was known to suffer, have been problems before. If you don't know, it's impossible to predict, but you have to warn the family. If behavior changes, you have to and let them know that this is an important aspect of the safety of the patient and your family. Um, if you have an uncontrolled infection, it's important also not to use steroids. And there are other reasons for you to be careful about the use of steroids, myocardial infarction, infarction, congestive heart failure, diabetes, which is uncontrolled, peptic ulcer. So all the things have to be kept in mind when prescribing steroids because of the risk of uh, further complications to the patient. Uh, so in summary, I would say that steroids are very potent. They have these very multiple uh, effects. 
the work group very quickly, uh, especially if given in, in intravenous routes. Uh, they are very useful in acute presentation as the fire extinguisher I showed you before. Not a very good option as monotherapy for long-term use. And you can see very well that paper from uh, showing the doctor using high doses for a long time, resulting in severe, serious uh, complications, systemic complications. Uh, it, it can be, has to be proportional to what you are needing, so use it adequately. Don't use small doses for treating severe disease. Be aware of the many possible side effects that are reported to you and the contraindications, and take all the measures you can to minimize them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for the elegant and wonderful lecture. Uh, I was wondering that whether you can take, uh, talk a little bit about the intravitreal implants, uh, steroid, like close and known astronaut implant yeah. or, or dexamethasin implant of steroid. Well, I didn't touch on them here because I'm, I'm thinking that Mark is probably going to be covering that when he talks. But um, we, we have been, of course, uh, recently having in our hands available different options for intravitreal therapy, intraocular therapy. We have been in the past, and I was saying, periocular steroids are very widely used because it was the only route that we could use. Uh, and, and the point study has shown that they are not as efficacious as intraocular route for the treatment of our patients, but they represent, at least if in an aphakic patient, still represent an interesting alternative to treat our patients with macular edema, for instance. But we have used Ozordex quite widely, dexamethasone biodegradable implant, which, which works relatively quickly uh, and provides a cover for about four months. No, it's not exactly the six months that was originally designed to, to be but it's a very effective route of treatment for patients with macular edema or more severe vascular, especially vascular uh, disease. Um, the the, the fluoxinolone uh, Illuvian or UTIC in the US um, is a good alternative which will lead for a much more prolonged control of inflammation. It's not the same as an Ozordex. So I, I tell my patients if Ozordex works, it doesn't mean that Illuvian will work equally because it's not just a, it's not a prolonged version of the other one. It's a different drug, a different release rate. So it is a medication that doesn't mirror exactly the effect of Ozodex. But in patients who are benefiting from repeated Ozodex injections, it is an interesting option to give a longer acting steroid that will last up to three years. So it is a good alternative for those patients. Uh, I just wanted to know that from you. Do you see a lot of sleep disturbances in uh, patient taking oral steroid, pay, uh, sleep disturbances, mood changes. Yeah, it, it, this is a very important consideration. I always warn my patients, and especially their family members, if there is mood changes, because the patient may not realize it. The patient doesn't know it's happening. It is the people around the patient who will recognize something wrong. So I do tell them about the possibility of their mood swings, and they become a very like, short uh, fused with the people around them. Uh, and so if that is all it is, but if it becomes physical, of course, then, then it's, a, it's a very serious problem because they can be aggressive uh, and, and they can make, you know, the, the thing, they can do things they would normally uh, do. So you, you need to get a history. If there's no previous exposure, it's difficult to guess who's going to behave that way. But we need to be mindful, especially if we're using a very large dose. Any history of psychosis or someone already on medication for psychiatric disorders, we should be extremely careful about the use of steroids because the consequences can be serious. So in this patient's local therapy, combined potentially with other forms of immunosuppression are preferred rather than trying to use a large dose of steroids. So, John. Yes, I just wondered, Carlos, do you recommend routinely giving calcium and vitamin D every time you give more steroids because of that rapid onset of, of loss yeah. of bone? Yes, I, I mentioned, I put in my slide, I ended up not speaking because I was mindful of the time, but you're, thank you, John, for bringing that up. Uh, I think especially in, in the Northern Hemisphere where the exposure to sunlight is not so great, vitamin D is usually quite low. So uh, and making sure the levels are adequate and calcium replacement. So usually these patients, the one thing that's important to, to, to consider is the following. If you are concerned about a steroid-induced osteoporosis and patients have a risk, only using calcium vitamin D is not enough. It's important, but not enough. You really have to use 
the bisphosphonates, as I highlighted. Uh, um, I think there are some other alternatives, and, and that should be in the hands of a specialist. I think as ophthalmologists have the, the, the uh, probably the our job is to recognize that this is a potential complication to start patients on these replacements of calcium and vitamin D. This is something we do. Uh, we can discuss with patients' options, but there are situations in which different drugs may be better than bisphosphonates, and that's what the specialist will help us with. But yes, absolutely, calcium and vitamin D, really important elements in the osteoporosis and osteopenia uh, prophylaxis. Bishali. Uh, Carlos, what's your opinion on local? I know it was marks, but I don't see marks. So any yeah. experience with supraconoidal and intravitreal injections and the yeah, cases this... where you would prefer a local treatment over the systemic corticosteroid? Yeah, I, I think the... Um... The supracoroidal, I still don't have experience. Zypier is not licensed in Europe, so I think our American colleagues will have some experience with Zypier. I haven't used it for, uh, of course, trials. We know about the data from trials showing the benefit of the supracoroidal route in managing macular edema and uveitis. Um, we, we're, some of us were involved in this uh, peach tree study which showed benefit, but I don't have personal experience with Zypier at the moment. In terms of the local approaches, uh, I think we... I feel that patients have either very asymmetric disease, unilateral disease, or patients in whom you have some concerns about systemic therapy are patients in which the local therapy comes in very handy. Of course, if the ocular disease is connected to systemic disease, then of course the treatment has to be systemic. And we know very well, like we discussed in Batches disease, we can't treat Batches local therapy because it is a systemic disease and we have to control the overall problem. But intermediate uveitis were patients with just uh, uh, macular edema. So for those patients, the use of local therapy is a very uh, useful uh, tool. Uh, I mentioned before, like birdshot is a condition in which you have choroidal and retinal vascular inflammation. And my experience with local therapies in choroidal inflammation shows it doesn't seem to control the choroid as well as it does for the retinal vascular component of the disease. So the, the point here, uh, is if I use in the birdshot patient an intraocular injection, I know that the, the retinal vascular leakage will stop, the edema will improve, but the choroidal disease persists. And if I don't control the choroidal disease, I end up with outer retinal damage in the long term. So combination strategies are always very useful too, because the systemic therapy can lead to the control you need, let's say, of choroidal inflammation, and reduces the burden because I don't need as much systemic therapy as I would need without the local therapy. So when I combine them, I tend to achieve better control uh, of the inflammation, reducing the amount of systemic therapy used. So I don't say one or the other. Sometimes these both combined can generate a good effect. But if you can go local, they work very well if the indication is correct. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baswas, can we move on to the next talk? Yeah, no, please. Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to invite uh, John Kempern, who has been like the figure for immunosuppression in uveitis. So all of us who use it so confidently are because of the results that John has been showing us how safe immunosuppression is in uveitis. So let's listen to John about how to go about giving immunosuppression to our uveitis patients. Over to you, John Kahn. Thank you. I'm going to play a talk that I made for various reasons, so here we go. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, of the AIOS and the IOSG for inviting me to talk on one of my favorite topics, um, where do we stand on immunosuppression to treat ocular inflammation um, slash uveitis? My objectives are to look into whether immunosuppression actually is safer than alternatives and if it's effective and then how to use it. I like to think of managing uveitis as having two stages, one of induction where we use high doses of steroids typically to get initial control of active inflammation and then one of suppression to maintain the control over the long run for those cases that are not remitting. So that's only applicable to the chronic cases and not to the remitting cases. And it's here that immunosuppression fits in. 
So the, turning toward the safety, we have the background of information from the transplant literature. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has actually explicitly designated certain immunosuppressive drugs as carcinogenic to humans. And these that they've identified include cyclosporin, azathioprine, lorambucil, and cyclophosphamide. However, in rheumatology, um, these are not generally thought to be especially carcinogenic. And so this sort of provides the context you know, where our patients are worried about the treatment. There are three sets of, immunos or of ocular inflammation studies that looked into this. The first one is a single practice cohort from Sydney, Australia, where sort of all immunosuppressive drugs combined together were associated with a fourfold higher incidence of cancer. Um, that's, and a lot of it was skin cancer in Australia, where um, skin cancer is sort of a, a situation that often comes up. I've been the PI or, or study chair of some other studies to look into this, including the site cohort study. And we've just published new um, updated publications with longer follow-up um, for cancer incidence, which was something new in BMJ oncology and for overall in cancer mortality in ophthalmology. And this BMJ oncology is not listed on PubMed, so you have to search it on Google. Um, short to midterm safety also was evaluated in the MUST trial and follow up study. So, if we look at the baseline or at the sort of table one for the mortality study in site, this was a very big study with about 16,000 patients studied for mortality over a median of 10 years with a large amount of median follow up for the different categories of immunosuppressive drugs and a huge amount of person time, almost 2,000 deaths and 40. 440 cancer deaths, roughly. And if we look at the results of that, we saw no increase with um, TNF inhibitors as a class, and particularly for adalimumab and infliximab. Actually, there weren't any events in the adalimumab for, um, for this one. And for anti-metabolites, we also see that there's no increase in risk, and if anything, a tendency towards less mortality. And we saw that for cyclosporin as well. Um, for alkylating agents, if we look, um, we have one group here with the squares that are the patients that include, it included the patients with systemic immune-mediated immune diseases. And for those, there was a higher risk, but for the ones that only had eye disease, it wasn't significantly elevated. But mostly we want to look at these drugs that we commonly use. And when we look at cancer mortality, we have similar results, basically. And if we look at cancer incidence, Again, the results are similar. I'm not going to get into the esoteric things about etanercept and tancrolimus, but which might be some indication for treatment bias. But but in any case, it tends to be lower even um, with adalimumab and with methotrexate. Actually, I don't interpret that as meaning that. It we looked at various cumulative dose thresholds, um, dose-response dose relationships, and we didn't see any increasing risk. So these data support the long-term safety for ocular inflammatory disease of the most commonly used agents with respect to cancer incidence and overall and cancer mortality um, for the drugs that we most commonly use. And differences from the, from the transplant scenario might be due to the fact that they get lifelong treatment and the transplant itself um, causes some disturbance of the immune system, and, and actually the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder often presents in the transplant itself. Skin cancers aren't addressed, at least non-melanoma skin cancers are not addressed in these studies, but some is advisable for our patients on immunosuppression. So looking at the MUST trial then, where we look both at effectiveness and at safety, um, this was a comparison of a completely local therapy with the registered implant, a long-lasting fluocetylone acetamide implant, versus systemic therapy using corticosteroids and immunosuppression when indicated, which was the large majority of the patients. And this largely followed this guidelines paper from 2000, for which Douglas Stapps is the first author um, in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And when we looked at the sort of efficacy side of this, we see that the implant tended to be better at controlling inflammation, although um, there wasn't much inflammation in the systemic group until we began to have it running out, at which point they overlapped. And at that point, we saw visual acuity 
sort of drop off about one and a half lines by the seven year follow up. And um, to me, that's actually a pretty good result for seven years of following patients. But the remarkable thing is that the systemic therapy was actually one letter better than baseline at seven years. So the effect was really marvelous. And if we look at the, um, let me skip that one. If we look at the side effects, the local side effects as expected were much more with the implant than with systemic therapy. But it's really like the majority that are having these problems and even 40% nearly getting the coma, whereas it's a substantial minority for the um, systemic therapy group. So less local side effects with um, the systemic therapy. And when we look at the corticosteroid and the immunosuppression side effects, we don't actually see any statistically significant increase, especially for the immunosuppressive drugs. The closest one to a difference was in the platelet count that was actually worse in implant, but not statistically significantly different. The one thing that we did see was that there were more patients who were prescribed an antibiotic um, for an infection in the systemic group. Um, this, in my mind, might have been due to biases because if you tell your primary care doctor that you're taking a as a therapy and you have a fever and a cold, you'd be more likely to get a uh, prescription. But in any case, this was statistically significantly different, but it didn't result in differences in hospitalization or death. Even in um, weight, we didn't see an increase in the systemic group. So the better mean visual acuity and long-term side effect outcome pattern with the systemic therapy using the sort of rheumatologic model from that guidelines paper suggests that the systemic therapy was the first-line treatment and had remarkably good visual outcomes, and it had a remarkably good safety profile. So now we establish both sort of the short to medium term safety and the long term safety. The implanted eyes had some, I think, are somewhat misunderstood from this trial. There were some remarkable findings that the duration was much longer than predicted. And in my view, there is a role for this um, when systemic therapy is impracticable or not adequately effective. Um, which I thought were occurring at about 10% of patients back when I was practicing in the U.S. And the problem seemed to arise in relationship to relapse. So if you're relying on this, you might consider a preemptive replacement. Although about half never did, about 45% never did relapse in the must trial and all its studies, but it's kind of desirable to wait in a way. So then um, getting on to sort of epic more about efficacy, we saw here, as we saw before, that the vision loss is rather limited with the systemic therapy. And with the reconstruction and the site study, also we see that most patients are getting a little better at first and then generally stable over time. Except the posterior they got after about five years back to baseline, maybe because of only vascularization being more common in that group. So these patients are doing very well is the point of this. And a couple of interesting things from that second study is that if they had cataract surgery before being referred, they were something like three lines worse than average, whereas if they had cataract surgery during follow-up by the systemic or by the subspecialty clinic, it was almost three lines better. And also, the, there was a dose-response relationship with vision being worse with the longer it took to refer the patient. So this kind of approach is effective. And these studies show that the average patient with uveitis is stable or even gets better with tertiary care even with severe cases. And um, proper uveitic care um, has substantial visual benefits. So it's not really the center that makes that happen, but there's definitely a skill in using the treatment. And so we should make sure that patients have access to this and such care is needed worldwide. So how to use it then? Um, indications for immunosuppressive therapy are disease that's controllable by corticosteroids, but requiring more than 7.5 milligrams a day maintenance therapy of prednisone or bioequivalent, or else it's causing side effects. Steroid sparing is the main indication. Failure to control with corticosteroids um, is a secondary indication, but beware that it might be infectious if it's behaving like that. And then some specific diseases, or if there are associated systemic diseases that themselves require immunosuppression. So those are the main indications. We tend to want to use it early in children, and I would suggest referring to uveitis specialists if you're going down this road, if possible. And the site and must suggest that this um, is a safe approach, as we mentioned. These are some of the conditions that um, are thought to respond better with immediately starting immunosuppression. 
and basically anything where you're it's likely you're going to fail with steroids alone for maintenance therapy it would be indicated now which drug should you pick there's not a lot of evidence of this but nisha acharya and colleagues produced the fast trial that suggested that the methotrexate was at least five inferior mycophenolate Um, but these recover with stopping, so it's not a lasting side effect. And others can be made to um, tolerate it by a dose of adjustment and a gradual step up at the beginning plus use of folic acid. Azathioprine hasn't been compared to methotrexate in trials, but probably is nearly as good, and there's a little bit less pregnancy risk, or there's less pregnancy risk with that. Um, Mycophenolate is popular in the West and by clinical impression and seems to work fairly often if methotrexate fails. Cyclosporin is becoming less popular because of perception that it's not as effective, and then alkylating agents are less popular because it is more cancer risk, but it may lead to durable remission in the very worst cases. So um, mostly we're using enzyme metabolites. PNF inhibitors and other biologics are coming up, and that's going to be covered in the next. So in summary, then, with robust safety data and the ability to step back from treatment and recover if side effects occur, Earlier and earlier use of immunosuppression is becoming popular. It takes a lot of chair time with patients and familiarity with monitoring labs, or else you can do it collaboratively, although I think it's best if one doctor decides both on efficacy and effectiveness and safety. It takes a lot of patience because especially anti-metabolites may not have their effects for several months. And fast look at the six-month outcome, and the site studies about this also show the odds that it's slow. And so we have to control with corticosteroids in the meantime. So there's a large clinician investment to doing this, and it's probably left to a specialist, more, mostly due to the danger. But it is an effective and Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, wonderful presentation. I have got a one question. Uh, do you... Do you feel that uh, mycophenolate is better or methotrexate is better, though the study shows? What is your practical experience? Methotrexate versus mycophenolate. I um, haven't been using mycophenolate since I went to Ethiopia because it's not available. But um, in Philadelphia, I found, I don't think I found too much difference between the two. We, we did a... Um, a, not a trial, but sort of a simulation of a trial from site um, where we compared the two, and it seemed like the mycophenolate might be faster in its effect, you know, and so that's something valuable. Um, and I think a lot of people have that impression, um, but I'm tending to still use methotrexate first line, sort of based on the hard data that support that and this, the cost effectiveness, which is especially important in developing countries. Thank you. May I comment on here, John? Yes. Just a quick one. I, I think the there was a pre publication not that long ago now from Nisha uh, comparing, I think, metotrexate and mycophenolate, and, and, and the results were uh, really comparable. I think the yeah. drugs are, are comparable. There's no real difference there. I think you're right about that. And of course, cost for of mycophenolate in many places, availability is a problem. I think the problem with metotrexate speed is that people start with a very low dose of metotrexate and escalate towards the, the efficacy. I have been in recent times really starting my patients at least from 15 milligrams a week. I don't go from 7.5, 10, 12. It's a very slow process. And, and I think by far, if you start with a dose, and there's no contraindication or any other medical problem. 15 milligrams a week as a starting dose is not a bad idea. And it yeah. might accelerate the benefit of that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the um, part of the reason methotrexate may be slow is because it's a once weekly dosage, and then we're often spending a long time scaling up the dose. And then historically, people have tried to maintain a lower dose, like in that site sort of simulated trial, the median dose was, I think, 12.5, and so relatively less. Um, Nisha's study actually went just the third week to 25 milligrams, um, so quite a high dose. And um, she said that they tolerated it pretty well with that. Um, so I think, you know, I agree with this concept that we should aim for sort of the highest dose, and then we should step back if it's not tolerated, because it may take several months, you know, maybe like six months to see if it works. And 
and we're having to use often fairly high doses of steroids, not infrequently during that time. So, um, so I agree. Um, we should sort of aim for high and then cut back. I'm usually aiming for 20 with oral just because I feel like 25 will be poorly tolerated. And, and um, I'm not sure if um, it seems to me like in Ethiopia, the patients aren't tolerating it as well as in Philadelphia. So I don't know if that has something to do with, you know, genericness or something like that. But um, I'd be interested in, in our Indian colleagues saying any comment about that since that's where we get all the methotrexate from. I use now 20, 15, 20 milligram yeah. methotrexate. I think in children, you need to use more because they metabolize the drug in a different way. So in children, the dose many times go about 25 milligrams or higher. But in adults, I think 25, in, in most of my patients don't seem to tolerate that very well. But I think 20 uh, is a level that I feel comfortable with. And uh, clearly beyond that, if you start realizing it's not working, then it's a question of changing your strategy. In these days, though, when possible, of course, depending on where you are, we, we can shift straight to a biologic if we can, uh, rather than trying to combine other drugs or anything like that, shifting towards the, the other immunosuppressants. But uh, I, I think methotrexate has in recent times gained, again, popularity uh, with the use because it's easy to use and uh, you generally well tolerated the, the uh, nausea is one of the key problems, especially for children. Nausea can be a pretty uh, difficult thing to overcome if you give orally. But if you give injected, then, of course, that tends to improve the side effects as well. I think, thank you very much. I think the, we'd ask uh, Dr. Bishali has to go so that uh, next uh, Dr. Bishali can give the talk. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So the topic for me is vitrectomy in uveitis. So when we talk of vitrectomy in uveitis, it can either be diagnostic or it can be a therapeutic. The diagnostic vitrectomy is performed whenever we have undifferentiated uveitis, you suspect any malignancy like lymphomas, or the patient is non-responsive to therapy. It's very important to understand that more important than doing the vitrectomy or the procedure is the handling of the samples. The samples, we have to make sure that we collect undiluted, diluted vitreous, and even the cassette fluid because that's very helpful for flow cytometry and other things. We need to have a dedicated lab who can carry out the investigation because Every lab cannot handle these samples. It's extremely important to immediately transfer the samples to the laboratory without any day or delay. And generally within 15 to 20 minutes, the sample should reach the lab. If cold chain can be maintained, that would be good because most of the cells would get desiccated and destroyed during the process of transport. It's very important that you plan beforehand what test you want to do and communicate it to your cytologist and pathologist because otherwise they will not really look for what you want. For example, if infection is being suspected, then of course PCRs, culture smear, but if you are suspecting malignancy, you tell them to focus more on cytology, flow cytometry, genetics, immunohistochemistry, so that they can use the most precious sample, which is the undiluted vitreous, for something which is more important to you. I'll give you an example of diagnostic vitrectomy. Now, this lady came to us as a case of non-responding intermediate uveitis in the left eye. There was no complaint in the right eye, but we did see some of these lesions all over the fundus. When we looked at the left eye, she had received multiple treatment, and you can see she even had a DEX implant in the eye. So vitreous was all hazy, and we could not see much details there. The autofluorescence of the right eye showed these, you know, punched out lesions, which were all over hypoautofluorescence. 
and fluorescein angiography showed that those lesions were hyper and stain kind of hyper in the late phase, which we did not know what it was. ICG showed that those lesions were near, not really at the level of the choroid, so more at the level of the RPE. Fluorescein of the left eye, we could not get much information because there was so much media haze. Now, what next? We thought of an infectious etiology and we did all the labs. And our main differential at that particular point was toxo and probably syphilis. So we did test. Montius came out actually to be positive, but you know, the phenotype was not suggestive of TB, so we did not pay much attention to it. At the back of our mind, there was a problem that could it be non-infectious, but non-infectious would generally respond to steroids and the worsening on intravitreal steroid was kind of, which was not in favor of non-infectious. We also played with the idea that probably left eye has got endophthalmitis following local steroids and there is some background syphilis toxo going on. In simple words, it was undifferentiated to us. So we asked patient to, uh, patient underwent uh, vitrectomy. She was on low dose oral steroids, which were stopped. And this is uh, the vitrectomy after the ozodex was cleared. This is actually the left eye. The surgeon's view, that's how you are seeing it like that. So once the uh, all the ozodex was removed, the vitreous was cleared, we saw these pre-retinal precipitates on the surface of the retina. Some vessels which were involved, and you could see they were occluded, and the similar pigmented scars that we were seeing in the opposite eye. And the OCT shows that majority of these precipitates were pre-retinal. So this is the autofluorescence done later on. But before that, I would like to, uh, which showed almost the same thing as the right eye. The fluorescein again did not show much. But there was diffuse involvement, there was vascular involvement, and there was these patches like we saw in the opposite eye. Now comes the OCT. OCT showed some of these bumps on the RPE. And uh, we, the, when we did the cytology, there was a single atypical lymphoid cell. I got this reviewed by Dr. Biswas, who thought it could be lymphoma. But looking at the phenotype, we were, you know, not very convinced. And since the disease was bilateral, we also knew that this patient needs systemic therapy as well. So we wanted to be very sure of the diagnosis. So we asked, we thought that maybe we are not seeing too much cells because there was an ozodex in the eye. So we tried to repeat vitrectomy after removing ozodex two weeks later. When two weeks later we did the vitrectomy, you see there were so many clumps of the vitreous and it was full of clumps. And during surgery, I thought, oh, maybe it's fungal end of thalmitis and not lymphoma. But anyways... We completed the vitrectomy and we took out the sample, and, but I did not inject methotrexate because I was not very sure whether it is lymphoma or not. And this time, within two hours of giving the sample, my sortologist called and said, oh, this is lymphoma. It's full of the sample this time is full of cells. So it was a case of B-cell lymphoma. And you can see it's an atypical presentation with all these bunched out lesions. So we have treated her systemically and this is how the eye looks like three months later. So this becomes the first and the foremost indication for where you are suspecting or you are not sure. The second part is therapeutic vitrectomy. 
Now, vitrectomy has a therapeutic role because vitreous is kind of a reservoir for all the pro-inflammatory cytokines, you know, and uh, what happens normally behind the hyaloid, all these cytokines accumulate and it's a reservoir. So the amount of the immunosuppression or steroids you need to take care of them is massive. But once you remove the pre-retinal uh, pre bursa, posterior hyaloid, the concentration of them decreases and then the vitrectomy adds in its therapeutic benefit. Secondly, the type 2 collagen in the vitreous has some arthetogenic and immunogenic properties. And maybe when we are removing vitreous, we are kind of, to some extent, taking or deloading the vitreous. And this is the bursa I was talking about. So if you have this, most of the uh, you know, cytokines are accumulated here. And even if when you are injecting, the drug is sometimes not reaching here because it's somewhere lost in the vitreous above it. So the removal of this hyaloid generally helps in relieving this reservoir and your need for subsequent immunosuppression or steroid goes down. To show the therapeutic benefits of the vitrectomy, now this is a young girl, 25 year old, we can see peripheral vascularized granuloma not responding to steroid. She has received anti-VGF and we started anti-TB, but there was not much response. She also had concomitant cataract, so she underwent a combined surgery uh, where she underwent first the cataract surgery by my uh, PECO surgeon. Sorry about this music. And... Uh, this was a foldable eye oil, and then we did the diagnostic 27G vitrectomy. So this vitrectomy, first I always do it under air to get the undiluted sample. And then you replace the air with the fluid, get the diluted sample and also the cassette fluid. So this is following the vitrectomy. So from the vitreous sample, we did detect rifampicin resistance. She was treated for drug-resistant TB and two years follow-up, she's 20, 30. Sometimes it's not only about debulking, but you know, uveitis patients develop complications. For example, this is a patient with acute retinal necrosis whom we were managing with intravitreal phosconate and uh, acy val acyclovir, but she developed a detachment in this area. Now, these are the kind of the patients, like you see the detachment, even when the disease was not really healed, the OCT shows the detachment and these are the patients. Oh, I'm sorry for this music. I don't know how to switch this but you can see you may need to do vitrectomy for these patients just to take care of the complications which arise out of the uveitis in this particular case there is retinal detachment so you remove the posterior hyaloid you have to make sure that these need very active gentle handling because the vitreous is going to be very adherent to retina, as you can see. I'm using a 20,000 cut rate, which is the best we have, and you can go. But you can see, it is so adherent, and the retina underlying is truly sieve-like. So you have to do it very gently. I will just pass on uh, this. And uh, like, I'm a retina surgeon, but like it's okay if one is not, so you may have to pass it on to your retina surgeon because some of these are the complications which need to be managed. And this is the patient in the post-operative period. Or Regardi developing, for example, in this patient with TB uveitis, I'm not going to show the video, but these are the circumstances which we have to recognize that what we have is the complication of uveitis and not the recurrence of uveitis. 
It's important to understand that this is not an exudative detachment. So giving any amount of steroids, thinking that the patient with, you know, TB uveitis has developed exudative detachment is not going to help. It's a case of reg RD on top of the infective uveitis and needs to be managed as reg RD. And this is the patient in the post-operative period. So to conclude, vitrectomy has a definitive role in three steps, diagnosis, decreasing the therapeutic burden of the disease and managing the complication of the disease. It's important to do a meticulous planning because that is the key to success. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Dr. Biswas, you are muted. Wonderful talk and you just uh, highlighted the usage of vitreous surgery in uveitis. I just want to ask you, the, what is your experience of uh, chronic uveitis in GIA uh, with cataract or uh, with the membranes there and what? intermediate uveitis, the complicated cataract and vitreous. We have done sometimes the lensectomy, vitrectomy uh, together or cataract extraction in intermediate uveitis combined with vitrectomy and intraocular lens implantation intermediate uveitis? Uh, for uh, JIA, I think it's important following the use of biologics. To be very honest with you, in my own practice, I do not see children who develop hypotony, BSKs, and complicated cataract. So my approach is not to let children reach that stage. Okay. So I start biologic very early in the course. Then over a period of time, I like to stop biologic and maintain it on methotrexate rather than first giving the methotrexate, child develops some complications. And when the disease is not responding at that time, I add biologics because by that time, quite a few of these complications have already occurred. Having said that, we still have patients or everybody cannot get biologics just like that. Yeah. So we do have children who will be in the very late stage of the disease. So the first thing is when I see them, even if it is complicated cataract, I do not do surgery in the first go. Till the time I have seen three months to six months of quiescence in my own clinic. So I increase their immunosuppression or even they appear to be quiet. I still wait for three to six months to document every monthly that the eye has been quiet. UBM, to look for the presence of any cyclic membrane, ciliary body atrophy, especially in patients with hypotony, because that helps me plan the surgery. IOLs are a big no for me in GIA. I'm a part of the group. We published it 14 years ago that you do Ozodex implant and you put IOL and these children survive. You know, they were doing fine for two, three years. And when there is a recurrence, there is interior capsule phimosis, there is posterior capsule phimosis, and one child developed retinal detachment. And now, very shortly, we are collecting our cases with 30 years of follow-up on JIA children. And what I personally learned from that experience, never ever put an IOL. It might look very good on the short term. But when we follow them after 10 years, 15 years, it honestly does not work. So I will not put, I will, if there is no cyclic membrane, simply a good lensectomy, making sure all the capsule and all those little fibers in the periphery are removed. Because if you are doing FACO, they like to preserve the posterior capsule. They like to yeah, place sure. it. It is a hypotenuse eye. So they don't remove everything from the periphery because they don't want to rupture the posterior capsule. And children have to, you know, pay a very heavy price for that. So I would just make sure everything is neat and clean, a very good clean AFAKIA. 
and leave it at that. If there is a cycletic membrane, then of course we have to combine it with VR surgery. I will not try to pull the cycletic membrane because it's very fibrotic. It's adherent to the underlying cycletic membrane, produces bleeding. So I would just put few radial cuts in between to relax it so that it's not going in a zipper shape fashion and keep these children on durazoles and myosteroids and immunosuppression. Vishali, I, I entirely agree with your point. Thank you. We are uh, friends. You always children. agree with me. I think we've been discussing this over the yeah, years. And absolutely. I've seen so many of our colleagues being very bold about putting AIOLs in children. Yeah. With AIA. Even and, in and our I IOIs. Yeah. Bharat talked about <laughs> it and he wanted to say why. <laughs> I know. think the, the point to make is is certainly in very young children, JIA, and, and uh, there's no way a lens will go well. Uh, I think if you have a child that, that grew with JIA and then at one stage in, in, in a young adult life, you have very good control. You may consider surgery Absolutely. differently. But very young age, I think I, I have seen so many disasters uh, following surgery, even as you say, initially it looks very nice, but uh, the, ultimately they are not doing very well. John, sorry, I cut you off. You put your hand up. You were very, uh, you know, just put your hand and I just boom, <laughs> broke in there. So, John, go ahead. Well, I think it was good to finish that discussion. This is something different. One of the things I've often wondered, Vishali, is if you do a vitrectomy, if you um, get some anti-inflammatory benefit from the aqueous getting into the posterior segment and the anterior chamber acquired immune deviation, um, which in which the antigen presented um, in the aqueous sort of develops a response to um, suppress inflammation. So do you think that that's part of the reason vitrectomy might be helpful for at least some cases? It could be. It could be. It helps. I don't know how it helps, but that could be a part of that, yes? Yeah. Just yes. a quick one on that, John. I think the... I think it was Janet Davies who published a systematic review of all the published information on vitrectomy in uveitis. And the conclusion was that we, we don't really have any evidence for the benefit. But if you if we look back, you know, I think what Vishali said, re removing the reservoir of antigens is one aspect. I think the second is what you mentioned. The acres now goes back to the posterior cavity and, and the protective effects could be there in reducing. And the other thing might be better penetration of drugs in the eye following the vitrectomy. So you have several potential mechanisms, but the evidence is very slim and we are planning a trial at Moorfield for that. So we're hoping to conduct a trial in Vishali. I may contact you to join us in this venture. So I'll let you know when we have our protocol ready to go. We had seen um, in one of the site publications about remission of intermediate UVIs, that remission was happening about two and a half times more often with uh, if vitrectomy had been done, which was done in, in that study mostly for complications, you know, so they might have actually been expected to do worse than the other group, but still it was not even half um, were having remission. So um, so it was something interesting, but it it's I thought because not even half were having remission, it was a little bit dicey, but um, but I think there can be other reasons for doing it as well. Um, so it's an interesting topic, I think. So we'll, I'll start the next yeah. talk. That would be the biologics. And Dr. Biswas, after that, uh, Dr. Pervezio will take up Mark D. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I need to leave, I'm sorry. We have the IUST meeting going on. <laughs> Good to see you, Vishali. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for all that course, Vishali. Thank I know you. That yeah, it's lovely to I have everyone. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So I have to go up. Uh, I will talk briefly. Uh, just because uh, we have time for not that much of time. So we'll be, I would like to listen to Dr. Carlos about uh, intermittent injection and implants. Let me start with the case. This is a 28 year old male who came to our clinic on 18th March, 2022. 
He complained of marked blooding of vision both eyes. History of recurrent oral aphthous ulcer and leg ulcer was treated elsewhere by a practitioner with oral steroid. And it did not show any improvement that the vision deteriorated. Vision in the right eye was 660, left eye was 624. So was given, I straightforward given the patient a subconjunctural injection of adalimumab once in two weeks for eight injection. Vision in the right eye improved to 660 to 69. Oral and leg ulcer got healed. What the patient received was a biologic agent which showed dramatic improvement. This is for the general practitioners and the postgraduate that I just making it a very simple. I'll be talking about biologics and uveitis and scleritis, like basic facts. I just wanted to talk about this plan, the talk like history of evolution of drugs in uveit, treatment strategy for non-infectious uveitis and scleritis, what are biologics, how do they act, classification of biologics, where they can be used, our experience with biologics, and work up before starting biologics, and few final comments. I just don't want everybody to go with the idea that biologics is a new agent and can be used in all cases. History, we have received, we have got the 1950s um, corticosteroids, which revolutionized the treatment. Gordon in 1956 published it. This took 16 years' time when the Ong et al. from Washington described the marcoptopurine and methotrexate. Uh, metotrexate in the usage of ocular inflammatory disease. And 28 ups, years after, CMT412 was the first biologic used to treat the inflammatory eye disease. Treatment strategy today still is the corticosteroids in various forms, topical, oral, intravenous, posterior, subtenone, intervital injections and implants is the mainstay of treatment of non-infectious uveitis. Immunomodulators comes next, which are resistant or some specific diseases where you straight go to the immunomodulators like methotrexate, mycophenol, propetyl, azathioprine, and cyclosporine. But some cases in recent years, we have moved to biologics, a new agent which has brought a paradigm change in our management of non infectious UVIT. What are the biologics? That the biologic response modifiers the bone of recombinant DNA technology, block activity of the bioactive mediators of the immune response. And there are several classes of biologics, TNF inhibitor, anti-interleukins, CD20, B cell detector, co-stimulatory blockade, and interferons. So TNF inhibitors, etanocept is big no for uveitis. It actually exacerbates uveitis. And we are very familiar with usage of other TNF inhibitors particularly adalimumab, infliximab, and sometimes golimumab. Sartolizumab, we don't have any experience. Anti-interleukin tocilizumab is quite uh, you frequently started using it, particularly in the uveitis with macular edema, non-infectious uveitis. There are other, other anti-interleukins are there like anakindra, jevokizumab, dacilizumab, and secukizumab. The CD20 B cell directed um, uh, drug is the um, rituximab, which are used in the scleritis and recalcitrant uveitis, which are not anti TNF uh, agents uh, not responding. So these are the biologic agents. So they are alternative in inadequate response, intolerance to conventional therapy, and first line of therapy in certain conditions like Bases disease. Today in the Google survey world, uh, patients are, when you are giving steroids, um, the patient will ask him such kind of medicine for usage in their UVHS condition. In fact, uh, the Humura, the adalimumab, received US FDA approval to treat adults with non-infectious intermediate posture and pan uveitis in July 2016. Where they act, I don't want to go to the mechanisms that details. So it acts on the antigen presentations to the T cells, um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, cytokines and chemokines. 
where the indicated, my first indication is basis disease, J-associated UVIDs we have also used when the patient can afford methotrexate with adalimumab. HLA-B27 associated UVIDs in recurrent, Bloch syndrome, recalcitrant down infectious UVIDs, recalcitrant scleritis, few cases of recalcitrant VKH and sarcoidosis we have used um, um, biologic agents. Basis disease, they present the cold, mobile, hyto high type of PN, severe vasculitis, arthritis, or phlebitis, vitritis with optic disc involvement. And these are the ocular features. When they have the systemic features like oral aphthous ulceration, genital ulceration, erythromatosum, dermographism, positive pathology test. J associated rheumatitis is another condition we have used um, biologic agents. Most common childhood rheumatic disease, most prevalent systemic disorder, or disorder in children with uveitis, arthritis of at least six weeks duration without any identifiable cause in children younger than 16 years have been described as juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This condition is often associated with uveitis, chronic uveitis, which often get unnoticed patients. Children don't complain of it. And by the time we see it, band severed cardiopathy, glaucoma, vitritis, cystoid macular edema, disc edema, hypertonic maculopathy, and thysis valva. Cumulative incidence of uveitis is quite a significant 8.5 to 25 percent in various studies. 10 to 20 percent patient can become blind due to the uveitis in GIA. So, psychomotor study is the one Professor A. B. Ramanan from Vistal, UK, and it is an excellent study. It's 90 patients. The study has to be stopped because there is a um, remarkable improvement in, in the comparison of the placebo controlled trial. So adalimumab in combination with methotrexate is an effective therapeutic option in children and adolescents with GI associated UVIDs. How are they used? Infliximab or rituximab has to be given intravenous infusion. Adalimumab and golimumab in subcutaneous injections can be given and very convenient. Instead of showing some literature, I thought that I'll share my experience so that the people uh, in our country would be able to see what it does. Uh, this is adalimumab and non-infectious uveitis. It is a retrospective observational study. Medical records of non-infectious uveitis treated with adalimumab was analyzed for the last six years, 2017-2023. The indication is the inadequate response to immunotherapy, intolerant to immunotherapy and corticosteroids for control of primary systemic disease. Criteria for the treatment success is control of inflammation, significant decrease in the disease recurrence, vision improvement, and vision stabilization. So 43 eyes of 26 patient age group, 16.98 years, sick, uh, main female common, uh, equal, mean follow-up period was uh, 20 um, months, and average number of intelligible injection was given 22 injections. Our common indications are GIA followed by the basis and few cases of VKH and encouraging spondylitis, we have used it. Disease inactivity was achieved in 97.7% eyes, and the disease remission at third month occurred in 74.4% eyes. And there's a significant visual improvement of 0.45 to uh, 0.24. Oral stress stopped completely in 46.2% person. Dose reduced to 2.5 milligram daily in 30.8%. Post-treatment visual acuity improved in 48 or uh, maintained in 37%, like almost 85% patient was benefited. Vision worsened in six eyes. Drug discontinuation is the one patient uh, and this patient was subsequently shifted to methotrexate, but had side effect. Relapse occurred in two patients, and the no systemic infection except one case. Just two days before, we are seeing the patient who has adalimumab developed uh, ascites, and the tubercular uh, organisms was found. Mycobacterium tuberculosis was found in the ascitic fluid, except one case of the 66 cases. There is no patient has adverse side effect. One patient receiving concurrent adalimumab and methotrexate developed raised liver in jail. This is one of the cases, the acute uveitis with um, 
complicated cataract. Patient three months took the treatment of adalimumab, and after again three months uh, of uh, the controlled eye, we did that uh, cataract extraction after adalimumab therapy and remarkable uh, quiet eye with improvement. The vision was observed. So factors affecting final visual acuity, cataract, central band cataracty, retinal detriment, secondary glaucoma, and hypertermy. So we concluded that adenomimab effectively control non-infectious uveitis. Um, the drug is safe and well-tolerated. It has also have corticosteroids and immunosuppressive sparing effect. Our latest work on basis uveitis where we use the immunosuppressive and base biologics applied in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Mainly the cases are posterior uveitis and pan uveitis. We used 40% of the patient, now biologic agents, and 40% steroid and immunosuppressive agents. Adlumab is the most common agents, followed by the infliximab. And there is a significant improvement in compared to the steroid when you use the biologics and immunosuppressive agents. This is a patient with um, dense vitritis, retinitis and vasculitis responded remarkably well after infliximab therapy. Newer biologics is golimumab, which can be used subcutaneously, has also been found to be useful in basis uveitis. We have recently started using HLA-B27 associated recurrent uveitis. This is a paper published in Ocular Immunogen Inflammation and Tumor Necrosis Factor Alpha again in the management of HLA-B27 associated uveitis. And most of the patients has ankylosing spondylitis. Blau syndrome is another condition, arthritis involving interphalangeal joints, and there's a maculopapular dermal rash. And we have uh, gyronotus uveitis with Bushakas nodules, and patient was treated with adalimumab and methotrexate, and there was a marked resolution of inflammation. So we had this in Blau syndrome, we published in in the 2018 in IGA, non-infectious uveitis and scleritis together, we have published 18 cases um, in 2020 in the general ophthalmology. Most of our cases were treated with adalimumab and in a uh, few cases with infliximab. Prednisone dose was reduced from 30 milligram to 5 milligram after biologic therapy. So tocilizumab is another drug that is particularly useful in recalcitrant non-infectious uveitis. Particularly when there's a macular edema is there and they seem to be very effective. This is a girl which has seen from 1999. You are treated with all kinds of medications, methotrexate, infliximab, adalimumab, developed resistance against it, developed cataract and huge cyst macular edema. And this was the macular edema in the eye. And after tocilizumab, there is a significant improvement of the macular uh, vision with resolution, complete resolution of macular edema. So rituximab is the last drug I'm talking about. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody against CD20 antigen. It is also effective in the refractory uveitis. Dose is 1,000 milligram per day you know, dose and is given intravenously. It works, so rituximab is a good option in various uveitic conditions and particularly scleritis. It acts on the B cell, CD20 cells, Mm, and this long-term follow-up patients with scleritis of the nutritional therapy, um, including B-cell monitoring, found to be extremely useful. And there's a resolution of treatment, a resolution of uh, disease in almost all patients in, in a series. So what are the recommendations before starting biologics? Complete blood count, ESR, CRP, liver function test, urine routine and microscopy, Mantuk test, IGRA, chest radiograph, hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-hepatitis B antibody, anti-hepatitis C antibody, ELISA for HIV. And these are the new drugs, the game changer in the UVHS non-infectious type. And there's a, another molecule has come. This is a small molecule, JAK inhibitors. It works on the JAK1 and JAK2. And, um, and this is the topocytinib is one of the JAK inhibitor. And we have published a recent series successful in nine out of the 10 cases of recalcitrant or internal to conversion therapy. This is a patient of a necrotizing scleritis with corneal involvement responded elegantly with the topocytinib therapy after one month. 
So in some conclusion, biologics have emerged as a new weapon in the armamentarium of management of non-infectious uveitis and scleritis. It works best in my experience basis and GI associated uveitis. However, we need more data, needs precautions before starting therapy, not exactly without side effect, can reactivate microtent tuberculosis infection um, in our country where there's a TB is uh, quite prevalent and is costly. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, many remember Dr. Esad Badirat, our chief, who recently passed away and we carry the legacy and life of the um, Dr. Esad Badirat. Thank you very much. Let me stop share. So, any can comments ask, from anybody? Can I ask you a we, couple? I think we could should go to the Dr. Carlos presentation. Uh, Jossi, I think uh, John has a question for you here. John, I was just taking ten years to us, like you need to do a tuberculosis. Um, work up before you start TNF inhibitors. And then if there are any sort of uh, biosimilar drugs that are available in India that are more um, in reach for patients to afford. Yeah. So there's this big cost has come down quite a bit. And uh, uh, because it works well, and uh, one or two injections after the patient themselves ask for it. And there's the improvement is sometimes quite dramatic. The other thing, John, that I think we need to add here is that before you start an anti-TNF agent, it's really important to eliminate the, the myelination because yeah. uh, we, we do have patients with intermediate UVIs especially. So uh, these patients have uh, MRI scans done and attempt yeah. to see if they have any evidence that might then make the indication for the anti-TNF a bit more complicated. Um, but if they don't, if they have a very well established diagnosis like a bird shot patient, so that wouldn't be necessary. But if you have any doubts, then of course the exclusion of that is important. I'm careful about the intermediate UV, I guess. Yeah. So, next talk is by Dr. Carlos. Dr. Mark did not give that, uh, got that link. It seems I just got the message. So, I will be asking, uh, requesting Dr. Carlos to go ahead and present the talk, intervitreal injection and implants in the uveitis. Okay, I just need to find my presentation here, Jossie, just give you one second. It is, I just need to find it to be able to share with you. Let's see if I can now go into this and find my, my file here. Let's see. I can go for that, sorry about this. I'm just trying to find the presentation. Interesting, it should be here, but I cannot see it for some reason. It's not appearing. Ah, okay, I think I might be able to check it now. Okay, give me one second. Apologies for this. Okay, here we go. I think I got it now. You can see it now? You got it. Yeah, very well. Okay, so... Uh, I'm just giving this presentation. Fortunately, our, our friend Mark Desmet could not join us, so um, I'm going to try to cover that with the local therapies in uveitis. Um, I think we all recognize that treating intraocular inflammation is a challenge for several reasons, is making a diagnosis, and of course the limitations of the options we have for treating these patients, which recently has changed. So when I started practicing, probably the same for, for Professor Biswas and, and John, uh, uh, the, the options were very limited. Luckily, in recent times, this has expanded, as you already heard uh, during the previous uh, presentations. And keep in mind that the loss of vision occurs usually in patients who are younger and usually as a consequence of more uh, of a chronic macular edema. So the penetration of drugs in the eye is limited by our natural barriers in the eye. We all know about that. So it's difficult to get drugs in the eye. In terms of local therapy, the choice, as I mentioned in the previous discussion, unilateral is symmetric disease. If the eye is the only reason for the therapy, if there is a contraindication or intolerance to systemic therapy, and in certain conditions, it seems that local therapy works better uh, in terms of control 
uh, and, and reduces the burden of other systemic uh, you know, the side effects of therapy that patients use. So in terms of local approaches, we know topical is very useful for anterior uveitis, and then you have the options of periocular injections, which I'll mention very briefly, the intraocular injections, and devices. So periocular injections is the posterior septinus injection that Dr. Nozick uh, described many, many years ago, uh, which is something I used quite frequently uh, before we had the option of using intraocular injections. And it delivers the, the medication closer to the posterior pole, so very useful for the management of um, uh, macular edema. Um, this is how they, they work. This is the posterior septinus here on your right, showing the, the, the position of the, the steroid is closer to the eye instead of an orbital floor injection, which puts it a bit further out. So you might need, in theory, that you have more diffusion of the drug and, and less efficacy intraocularly, even though that has not been demonstrated. Um, intraocular injections have the advantage of a bypassing of barriers. So my periocular injection still has to get into the eye, usually via scleral diffusion. Here now I'm putting a needle through the sclera into the eye, bypassing that barrier, reaching a high concentration, which tends to be very efficacious but short-lived. Uh, the preparations that were uh, considered, dexamethasone is very, the clearance is very fast, so not very useful for a, a long-term control. And trantinone acetonide being hydrophobic would allow in a novitrectomized eye levels of up to three months. We all remember using Kenalog, totally not appropriate because of the, the real indications are intramuscular, intraarticular injections. But then, of course, this was superseded by formulations which were designed to be used intraocularly. And they have a very, very fast effect in macular edema. Of course, the complications are related to those related, connected to the needle in the eye, which is infections and, and hemorrhages um, and potential retinal detachment. But there are also complications related to the drug itself, so ocular hypertension and cataract mostly. The point study, as I mentioned before, compared the use of periocular and intravitreal steroids and, and looking at the transcinolone and the dexamethasone implant, and it demonstrated that the intraocular approach was superior in terms of efficacy comparing to the periocular approach. Just a quick mention to VGF. VGF is also involved in, in, in expressed in the eyes of inflammation, especially those eyes that are showing macular edema. So trying to uh, control the VGF might be another way of avoiding the steroid complications and achieving control of macular edema. of the effect is limited and it becomes a problem of long-term control using this approach. But in patients who are steroid responders and there's no other alternative, it may become a useful tool. So macular edema is the one I'm mentioning here. It can be used as well. I'm going to skip a bit because the time is more limited. This talk was designed for a longer presentation. But remember that they're also useful for choroidal vascularization. But the important thing to remember in this is that when you're treating choroidal vascularization in UVAT patients, the drive that is making the vessels grow is inflammation. So just using the block of the anti-VGF is not going to be enough. You need to combine this with the anti-inflammatory therapy. So the combination is superior in, in leading to long-term control and preventing recurrences. So you really need to control the underlying inflammation. These are some evidence about the, the treatment uh, combining therapies and just showing that the combination of the anti-VGF with the oral steroid tends to lead to better control and reduced risk of recurrences. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. So going for the devices, the drug delivery systems, they're carriers that allow the drug to be delivered into the eye for an extended period of time following a very controlled release rate of the drug. So it, it is uh, something that was initially designed by Bausch & Lomb with the retrocert implant, which had fluoxinone acetonide, requiring a sutured device to the eye wall uh, and releasing the drug over 30 months of time. The release rate was 0.3 to 0.4 micrograms on a more steady state, but initially the, the release was a bit higher. Um, there were problems, this is a photograph of the implant uh, in, the, uh, in the eye just behind the lens, very anteriorly located, uh, and there was uh, some trials demonstrating the benefits of this, the American trials comparing to different concentrations of the drug, and then another more European trial or international trial in which it was a comparison of the 0.59 milligrams to uh, the standard of care. 
and essentially in the, tr the trial show, and I'm going to skip here to this image, this, this Kaplan-Meier, which shows very well that the patient receiving the implant uh, had a, a much longer protection in terms of time to recurrence when comparing to patients receiving the standard of care. So they, they had a significant control of the inflammation and a significant reduction in recurrences. The problems, of course, happen with control of intraocular pressure with a very large number of patients requiring surgical intervention to control, which was one of the reasons why this device was never approved by the European Medical uh, Medicines Agency. Uh, this is cataract, of course, expected with a long exposure to steroids. And you can see that after 18 months, the frequency of cataract increases quite significantly, and most patients will require cataract surgery um, in, in within the uh, time of the study. So this device uh, resulted in lower rate of recurrence, stabilized or improved vision of the patients, uh, also reduced the, the, the disease burden, but on the other side, added on the adverse events of the medication injected, which is a cataract and pressure-related uh, problems. Ozodex, also mentioned before, the dexamethasone biodegradable device tested in the trial, uh, Euron trial, uh, which was comparing two different concentrations of the dexamethasone with a sham injection in a randomization of one to one to one, and essentially showed that vitreous haze, which was the primary outcome measure, uh, achieved uh, significant uh, control over the sham injection of reducing the vitreous to a score of zero. We look at best corrective visual acuity, also achieved a much better outcome in improvement of more than 15 letters from baseline. Uh, in terms of uh, occurrence of side effects, we're very few, but remember this is a short study, about six months, so the data is related to that period of time and didn't show many, many problems, especially the not significant problems with pressure. Um, in, in terms of IOP, as you can see here, uh, not a significant uh, effect, but uh, the, the 700 micrograms actually show you, show you more problems related to control. So the final decision was uh, exactly to uh, show the, seven, fifth, the 700, because the difference was not significant in terms of the side effect, but the, we, we had a, a very significant effect of this drug. So 700 micrograms uh, led to, ended up being the one adopted as the product that we all use. And there are several publications from different centers showing the uh, use of this device as in real world experience, repeated injections, and it seems from this experience, our experience as well, that the, the medication re re effect is reproducible. It happens after injections and the negative side effects don't seem to increase over time following these injections. Of course, exposure to steroids in terms of pressure is different and it may very well increase, but it hasn't been a very significant problem. The fluoxinone acetonide implant, the uh, new tick in the US and the Luvian in Europe, is, is the fluoxinolone is the same drug as the register, the first one that I showed you, it is producing a release rate of about 2.2 micrograms over a prolonged period of time. Uh, and it does seem to uh, you know, produce this very stable release of the drug, which is very important uh, in the control of inflammation. Uh, the trial was designed to compare uh, patients uh, receiving uh, treatment, standard treatment, to patients receiving the device on a two-to-one randomization, and the endpoints were at six months, the primary endpoints, and the patients were followed up for 36 months looking at efficacy and safety analysis keeping in mind that the patients on the treatment control would be rescued according to need uh, on the opinion of the investigators. This is to show you the comparison here of the two groups uh, uh, when considering the six-month data and 36-month data, in which you can see very clearly that very soon at the initiation of trial, the treated control arm, most patients were recurring within six months, uh, while in the uh, treated uh, with the implant arm, uh, the patients were, uh, even after 36 months, 34.5% of the patients had not experienced a single recurrence. When we look at total number of recurrences, the patients, um, they, if you look, look at the total period of time, most patients had zero, as you see here, 34.5, or one recurrence, another similar figure of 35%. So 30, nearly 70% of the patients had either no recurrence 
or one, or one recurrence during that period of time. If you look at the survival curve here in terms of time to first uh, recurrence, this is different, sorry, it's a time to first recurrence, not a survival curve. We can see the comparison between the two groups shows a very significant difference of 657 days for those receiving the implant against 70.5 days for the treated control arm. And the number of recurrences also significantly reduced uh, from 5.3 to 1.7 in mean number of recurrences. When you look at genitive therapy, the implanted eyes are receiving uh, significantly less medications than in local, periocular, or systemic. In terms of vision, of course, the patients were rescued, as I mentioned before, so the preservation of vision was uh, the most important thing, so the, the two groups were similar in that respect. But if you look at gains and look at losses, the group receiving the implant had less losses of significance and more gains of significance. Pressure was an important factor because we are always concerned about the risk of a, a pressure going up with a longer acting implant as it did with the first one. And in this case, it didn't show that. Actually, the patient receiving the sham arm of, of the this, this study of receiving the control were the ones who were having more problems with pressure because they were receiving as a uh, rescue therapy, local therapies. And this is a problem that was probably creating more of different types of steroids leading to the pressure and behavior being different. So they were rescued with more drugs because they had more recurrences and ended up developing more pressure problems. So recurrences were significantly reduced, a longer time to recurrence achieved, less adjunct therapy required, larger improvement in vision, and actually not an issue with intraocular pressure control. This is just a case I show very briefly a birdshot patient in which uh, I proceeded with injection of illusion. And you can see here, what is important to demonstrate to these patients is the fact that the RPE is being damaged by the progression of the choroidal disease. And if you just treat them locally, that will not be changed. So these patients were sh shifted here to adalimumab, and over time, the choroidal pathology was completely controlled. And this patient then had a combination of having the illusion in the eye uh, to control the retinal vascular leakage and the systemic therapy. Superchoroidal space and the use of superchoroidal injections, as asked by Professor Gupta before, is something that the experience is building up probably more in the United States because IPEAR is licensed there, but not for us. Uh, but it seems to be an interesting approach, uh, but I, clearly I have no personal experience to comment here. Um, I'll just skip here. So I think options are becoming available. They are effective. Some of them can be short-lived, uh, and of course, there's a range of potential complications. Keep in mind, this doesn't result in remission, so the need to continue therapy is there. Differently, like John presented before, some drugs we use systemically may induce remission. We don't achieve that with local therapies. We have new alternatives which are undergoing studies. Uh, hopefully, we'll be achieving longer duration and beyond steroids. As uh, Professor Bees was mentioned, tocilizumab, a very good alternative for macular edema, and now Meerkat and Sencat studies are coming in to uh, demonstrate the efficacy of local use of uh, uh, anti-IL-6 therapy in the management of macular edema uh, in UVI. So I think we are expanding our options and looking for alternatives that will minimize the side effects of the local use of steroids. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the wonderful summary. Uh, due to the paucity of the time, we are not taking questions. I'd like to thank all of the speakers, Dr. Carlos, Dr. John, Vishali, and Mark couldn't join. So it was, I thank AIOC for the, giving us the opportunity, AIOS, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, so. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you. Very good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll had a wonderful you. session. Thank you so much, everyone. Looking forward for many more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We'll see you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you JP, sir. See you. Thank you.